Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Thursday. This is Seattle Now. I'm no bird expert, but I've been paying close attention to my feathery neighbors during the pandemic. I hear a bird in my neighborhood that sounds a little like a clothesline, like bleep, (laughs) bleep, in the morning sometimes. Oh, interesting. Don't know what that is. Hey, I said I wasn't an expert. Lucky for me, Olivia Sanderfoot is a bird expert. We'll take a walk through one of the hottest birding spots in the city in a minute. But first, let's get you caught up. Melinda French Gates could be headed her own way, as in away from the Gates Foundation. The nonprofit announced yesterday that as part of their divorce, Bill and Melinda will give a two-year trial period as co-chairs a shot. But if working together isn't working out, she'll resign and take a payout to pursue her own charity work. The couple also announced another $15 billion donation to the foundation's endowment and a plan to add new trustees to the board. A group of international climate scientists has turned around a quick study on June's deadly Pacific Northwest heat wave. It's a first glance and it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but their takeaway is definitely getting attention. The World Weather Attribution Group said yesterday that the heat wave couldn't have happened without climate change and fossil fuel emissions make it at least 150 times more likely. They estimate that the heat wave was a one in 1,000 years event, but warn it could be more like five or 10 years by 2050 if carbon pollution continues. And it looked like Seattle was in for another summer without a music festival. But surprise, a new mini music fest announced they're taking over the Seattle Center this Labor Day. It's called Day In, Day Out and already has a slate of local and global artists on deck. A one day ticket will cost you $80, $145 for two days. Lockdown gave us plenty of time to observe everything going on in our neighborhoods, including all the birds and animals in the city. I know I've been enjoying the chickadees and sparrows outside my window. That got the Seattle Now team curious about birding, you know, the hobby. I went to the Center for Urban Horticulture on the shore of Lake Washington to chat with Olivia Sanderfoot. She's a birder and PhD candidate in avian research at the UW, and I was surprised to learn she wasn't always a big fan of birds. I actually was a bit scared of birds when I was a kid. (laughs) Yes. I used to spend a lot of time at my grandparents' house on the shores of Lake Michigan. I'm from Wisconsin, and they have this cliff leading down to the water, and it's full of swallow nests. And when I was a kid and they swooped above my head, I found that to be quite frightening. But as I grew older, I started to learn more about birds. And then when I was in college, I took a birding class because I thought it would be an easy A, actually, not because I had any sort of affinity for birds. And it just was totally eye-opening and changed the way I saw birds. And I became quite passionate about birds and then was able to pursue graduate research focused on birds. And here we are. You went from being fearful of swallows to immersing yourself (laughs) in the study of birds. What Mm -hmm. is it that you truly came to love? I think it's really easy to just lose yourself when you're outside birding. In order to find them, you really have to pay attention to your surroundings. So it's like meditation. You can't just be wrapped up in your own head. If you really want to get good at this and if you want to see as many birds as you can find or even just watch one bird, you have to just get out of your own head and stay out here with them. I find birding to be a meditative experience for me, but it can also be incredibly exciting if I see a new species um, for my lifer list, or I see some interesting behavior I've never observed before, or a beautiful call I've never heard before. I just get filled with adrenaline and I want to track the bird. And so it kind of switches back and forth between being really peaceful and also just like incredibly exciting, which I think is fun. Now, when I think about birding, I have an image in my mind of usually an older white dude, (laughs) maybe in a helmet or a hat and like a vest with pockets and binoculars. Mm -hmm. Do I need a lot of gear to come out here and make this happen? No, uh, you do not need any gear to start birding. I think that 
birding has this reputation for being a hobby that's largely inaccessible and only for older white men. And that's just simply not <laughs> true. Anybody of any age or background can get started with birding. You can start by looking at birds out your kitchen window or going for a walk in your neighborhood, even if you live in a, in a highly urban area, and looking at the birds around you, noting their calls, observing their behaviors. That in and of itself is birding. You don't need binoculars you don't need a bird guide you don't need the cargo pants you can just get outside <laughs> and start birding and there are a lot of people a lot of truly wonderful people who are quite active in the birding community who are dedicated to breaking down barriers and making it clear that birding really is for everybody it's not just for older white men <laughs> everybody <laughs> is welcome welcome here and i hope that the more we get that message out and the more we do the the work that is necessary to make people feel like this space really is for them and that they're welcome here, the more diverse this hobby will become. Well, I love that you're saying this because for me in my neighborhood, I love to wake up early in the morning and I can hear, you know, the chickadees. I can hear a few birds I can't identify yet. And I love that. It sounds like you could really just walk out of your house. Oh yeah. I tell a lot of beginner birders that one of the great ways to get started is to just simply walk outside and start making observations of the birds you see in your neighborhood, in your backyard. Oh, that was a bald eagle calling, that, that high-pitched uh, call right there. And you don't have to train your eyes toward the skies. Yes, many birds fly, but birds are also observed at every vertical layer in the forest canopy from the forest floor all the way to the tops of trees. And you can see all sorts of different bird species just by looking at different pieces of habitat wherever you are and that I think is important because you that makes it more accessible already because if you're somebody who doesn't have a pair of binoculars and you think I'll never be able to see the tops of trees you don't need the pair of binoculars to get started you can start looking at bushes and see towies and chickadees and bush tits just hanging out right by you at eye level can we take a quick walk yeah all right great let's do it yeah. I love the Center for Urban Horticulture because it is accessible and there are so many different bird species that live here um, and I think that is largely because there are so many different types of habitats. So right now we're walking by the wetland um, but we just emerged through this beautiful grassland habitat and all of those different places are homes to different kinds of birds which I think is super fun. Are these swallows that I'm seeing up here? Yes, these are swallows. Uh, my bet is that these are violet green swallows. Wow, these are lovely. So the, there are definitely a couple of different types of swallows here right now. So this one right here, that's the violet green. It does actually have violet and green color to it, but it's kind of hard to tell in this lighting. And I just saw a barn swallow too. To me, they just look like little flying darts in the sky. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great description. They do look like darts the way they fly and they're so fast. And they are just going to town. And will they do this all day? There's probably 60 birds flying around here, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Uh, they will definitely keep this up as long as there are insects to eat and they're comfortable. They might take a break as the temperatures increase in the afternoon or if this rain cloud um, comes early this morning. Uh, but yeah, they're just going to keep feeding. Birds have to eat a lot of food. They have very high metabolism. So foraging is a very big part of how they spend their day. All right, let's see what else we can find. Okay, so we're just here along the edge of the water and I can see a lot of little brown birds <laughs> in the trees. As we're standing by this still pond, Olivia is looking through her binoculars and pointing out all these birds. I don't know if I'd even notice half of them if I was just walking by. This is a little swift. Oh my gosh, I did not even notice that bird. Look at your trained eye at work. <laughs> and then there were some house finches on these branches just a few moments ago. Oh, there's another one right up there. Yep, I recognize those guys from my backyard, mm -hmm. but that little swift I would have never seen. Yeah. They're great at camouflaging. It's actually quite rare to see them so still. They're usually swooping. Um, is that so a baby? Looks so young. 
It's very little. I, I, I don't think it's a juvenile. I, I think it, this is just a small, a small species. Up here we have a, f a flicker. Uh, nope, oh, I'm wrong. That is a juvenile robin. And then, who else do we have over there? Okay, we've got house finch. Another house finch, lots of house finches on these branches. Spotted towhee back there. The towhee is the one making that ringing call in the background. I, they're a bigger than house finches, but they have these really dark, boldly colored heads and then an orange color um, in their abdomen. This is a pretty, pretty sound. Mm -hmm. That little trilly sound, that like brrrr, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the towhee that mm -hmm. you're talking about? Yes. I love it. Yes, it's very fun. Oh, and there's something very big flying over. Let's check it out. Oh, that is an osprey. It's got something. It's carrying something. Oh, I, I can see it. I think it's got some big fish. Very cool. Olivia wanted to figure out the name of the little swift we saw, but she was drawing a blank. So she pulled up eBird. It's a crowdsourced birding app, and she was looking to see if anyone had logged a swift like that nearby. This is a map of hot spots, and I'm gonna zoom in to Washington. I'm gonna zoom in to Seattle. And do you see all of these dots? These are all hot spots that people have created. So people go birding and then they enter in what they saw mm -hmm. to help other birders. That's cool. Is it popular? Is it filled a uh, lot? It is quite popular. eBird has millions of records from, I think, over 600,000 observers wow. all around the world. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So now I've loaded the last sightings. So here you can see that on July 6th, which is the last um, day somebody documented birds here, uh, folks saw Canada geese, wood ducks, gadwalls, mallards, etc. And it looks like Bow Swift. Oh, there you go. So we're going to look up Bow Swift and see if that looks like the little guy that we just saw. And yeah, sure enough, I think that's exactly there it the is. little guy oh, that we saw. We figured it out. I think it's really good to start by thinking about what the different kinds of birds are. So if you can narrow it down and you can say, I know this was a swallow or a swift. You are miles ahead of the game. Now you know to go to your guidebook and look for swallows and swifts or consult eBird or um, email a friend and say, hey, I, I saw this. Is this something you would have seen um, in the area? I love it. I really appreciate this time with you. Yeah, this has been lovely. Thank you for sharing my hobby with me today. I hope others consider getting out there. It's, it's just a hobby that's brought me so much joy. I'd love to share it with more people. Hey, thanks for listening today. Want to see some photos of our bird walk with Olivia? Check us out on Instagram. You can follow us at Seattle Now Pod. Claire McGrain produced today's show. Our production team is Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Diana Opong, and Jason Pagano. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.